to recapsulate some of the items that we've already talked in section 5.3 working with the foundations and then another way of looking and another way of an analyzing taking advantage of reference angles and kind of seeing how they come into play so we'll start with our good old bow tie diagram one more time talked about it before four different angles represented by those little arcs that you see on the inside here each one has a respective and symmetrical terminal point x y negative x y negative x negative y x negative y all four of these have what an underlying right triangle that we could build by what connecting the terminal point back to the x-axis creates four similar triangles and not only are they similar they're absolutely identical these four little angles we'll talk about them one more time they are reference angles each one of these angles notice how i have the subscript little r there are made by what they are the angle that is made by the terminal point with the x-axis each one of these terminal point angle created with the x-axis you can think of it if you want to go back to some of our sokotoa stuff say hey the angle that these different hypotenuse make with the ground that's another way that you could look at it but bottom line what they're really doing is making an angle with the x-axis and we have three basic pieces that we know. We know an X and Y coordinate, and we know the length in this visual of the hypotenuse. And what's also important is to recognize what? Well, this hypotenuse is really nothing more than what? The distance from the origin to our terminal point, whatever that might be. So bottom line is our trigonometric relationships are nothing more than a series of ratios between Y, X, and R different combinations obviously and that's the part that we've built so far as we work through this now I'm gonna give you something kind of in a verbal format this would be a nice one just you can go back and obviously look at your bow tie document no problem there but just take a look at the statements here because it's a nice way it's a good idea I would as I say before go ahead and just kind of freeze this video after you listen to this piece for every terminal point in the XY grid, every terminal point that we could go to, we can build an angle in standard position. Standard position. There's our standard position along the X-axis. And then what? Our terminal point is, well, wherever I decide to rotate this pen, whatever quadrant, but I can always build an angle. My pen, once I rotate it, becomes what? The terminal point. That's what the angle is that I'll create. And the six trig ratios for whatever angle I build are nothing more than those ratios amongst the following. I'll just repeat it again. The X coordinate value of the terminal point, whether that's positive or negative. The Y coordinate, whether that's positive or negative of the terminal point. So an important statement, important statement here. The location of the terminal point, whether the X or Y coordinates happen to be positive or negative, are going to impact the underlying and eventual trigonometric values for that angle. What's the last piece? It's just the value of R, which we say, you know, from the Pythagorean theorem, X squared plus Y squared equals R squared. That's fine. But another way to just remember to look at it is R. It's nothing more than distance from the origin, 0, 0, to the terminal point, X, Y. And then here again, these are all our trig ratios, all between what? Our Y coordinate, our X coordinate, the R value, all those different combinations. And what's the last thing that we did? Well, work through some other pieces to help us realize, based on what quadrant you are, is your X coordinate or Y coordinate going to have a positive or a negative sign? So again, I suggest work through all these pieces, get a feel for this understanding. If nothing else, freeze frame this, read it a bunch of times, then go ahead and move on to the rest of this video. As you become comfortable with this, as you become comfortable with the diagram that you see in our 5.3 foundations, the bow tie diagram, the more successful you're going to become in this particular unit. So the last piece that I want to walk through is the following. It's a version of the bow tie diagram that I hand drew. It's not quite the scale, but just take a look at what I've done here. I'm going to work with some real numbers this time, as opposed to just that generic theta that we work with in the bow tie diagram. I've created four arcs, same colors, red, black, green, blue. 
they all do terminate in symmetrical locations. I can build a bow tie diagram. And here again, you just kind of see 57 degrees, 123 degrees is my black arc. My green arc is 237. My blue arc is 303. All again, we're doing all this in degrees. Radians, everything else would apply. The same concepts would apply. And so I built bow tie diagram. And we're going to talk about these shaded angles in a couple moments. But I know my first bow tie, my red triangle in the upper right, has a what? A 57 degree angle. And I therefore know a couple of interesting things. And this was solved just with my calculator. I didn't build the right triangle and find these coordinates. But I just simply said, hey, what's the sine of 57? What's the cosine of 57? What's the tangent of 57? And I took those answers to two decimal points. So we're going to tuck that information away. We're going to see how it comes into play for our other three angles because these four angles share a common characteristic. That common characteristic is the value of the reference angle. In this diagram, since I didn't have enough space, I've kind of shaded in those little angles that I want to look at. That little shaded area, it's designed to capture an angle, the green and the blue, all designed to do the same. And what I want to figure out is for, for the angles that I've built, what is the measure in degrees of those little inside the bow tie angles? And so here's what we've done. We take a look at the following. My 123 degree angle, that's where the bow tie piece would live. My 237 degree angle, here's where the bow tie piece would live. Let me just slide this over, I apologize. And my 303 degree angle, there's where my little bow tie angle, and again, these are called the reference angles. Well, let's kick back over here how big is that little angle? Well, I know if I went all the way from x-axis to this x-axis, I would have covered 180 degrees. I've only done what with my angle? 123. 180 minus 123 tells me the size of this angle, 57 degrees. Here, I've traveled what? 237 degrees. My angle is made again with the x-axis. What do I know? Well, Simple way to look at this is, I can say this angle is kind of how much I overshot 180 degree angle. You could talk it through that way. I went 237 degrees. Well, what do I know? Well, if I only stop, if I had stopped right there, I only would have gone 180 degrees. I kept going until I got to 237 degrees. What's the size of this angle? This terminal side makes with the x-axis over here. It must be 237 minus 180 degrees, 57 degrees. And finally, a 303, well, I kind of fell short of doing what? A 360 degree angle, and I fell short by what? 360 minus 303, or 57 degrees. So the important thing to note is what? These angles all share 57, 123, 237, 303. They all have a reference angle equals 57 degrees. And what it also means, remember, four identical triangles. All these dimensions are going to be the same, just some positional differences. And so that means the dimensions of any of my bow tie right triangle is going to be the same. And my trigonometric ratios are going to be the same. Bottom line, I can take everything I know for 57 degrees, and it's going to apply perfectly. These ratios are going to apply perfectly to the partner angles in the other quadrants, 123, 237, 303 degrees. Only difference, position. Sometimes my x coordinate is going to be positive, sometimes negative. Sometimes my y coordinate will be positive, sometimes it's negative. And that's where our good friend, all students take calculus, comes into play. In quadrant <clears throat> one, what do I know? x and y are positive. All the trig functions are positive. Exactly like I saw here. In quadrant two, what do I notice? S, the sign is positive. Why? Because the Y coordinate is positive, but the X coordinate is negative. And look what happens as I go through my calculator here. Positive answer for sine, 0.84, just like for sine of 57. Negative 0.54 for the cosine, because it's what? The X coordinate over R, so to speak. The X coordinate, negative. Tangent is Y over X, X 
positive, excuse me, x negative, y positive, I'm going to get a negative number. What do you notice? Same values, except what? Cosine, tangent, both negative. Sine's the only thing that's positive. S, sine, all students take calculus, quadrant two. It's the sine that's positive. Quadrant three, run it off your calculator, and that's what I did for all these. The sine of 237 degrees, again, everything to two decimal points, is a negative number, negative 0 0.84. Cosine, negative 0 0.54. Hey, same numbers applying. Tangent, 1.54. All students take quadrant three. Only tangent is positive. 237. For sine and the cosine, they took what? The negative value associated with what? Their good old friend at 57 degrees. Last quadrant. Here's what the calculator tells you for the sine, cosine, and tangent of 303 degrees. C in your mnemonic. Hey, it's just the cosine that winds up being positive. The sine and tangent are negative. So bottom line, what does this all come back to play from? For any angle, no matter where we put it, if we can find its reference value, we can then take the values the trigonometric values out of quadrant one for that reference angle. Get those values and apply them to our location. And all we need to do is figure out the position of our location and adjust accordingly. Quadrant one, all the trig functions are going to be positive. If your angle's lying in quadrant two, you can take your quadrant one trig values and do what? Change the sine on cosine. Change the sine on tangent. Make the cosine and tangent negative. Keep the sine value positive. If your angle happens to be in quadrant three, you can take what? Your quadrant one answers and do what? Make your sine and cosine negative. Keep your tangent positive. If your angle is in quadrant four, if you know the reference value, you can take your quadrant one values and do what? Leave the sine Make it now negative, the sine function becomes negative, the tangent function becomes negative, the cosine stays positive. Why is this all important? Yes, I know we have calculators and we can build this. What we're going to see is we're going to learn a series of special angles and special values in quadrant one. Knowing these special values in quadrant one saves us having to understand them in any other location. We can apply our quadrant one concepts. Fortunately, what? All trig ratios happen to be positive in quadrant one, and we can take those and then project them into the quadrant where we wind up working. That's the key to everything and what the reference angle's power lies in, the fact that they can let us take simple answers in the first quadrant and easily project them to other quadrants.